Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for a LinkedIn Live event with MIT Sloan Executive Education. We're all tuning in from the Boston area, but let us know in the comments where you're joining from. We'd love to know. Today's event is about MIT's Advanced Management Program, or as we call it, AMP, or AMP for short. Before we dive in, I'd like to introduce you to the AMP team. They're joining us here today. We have Court Chilton, Faculty Director, Alex Donovan Shockley, Program Director, and Molly Schneider, Program Director. These three incredible program leaders will share an overview of the AMP program, an overview of what to expect, and then we're gonna ask them every question you could think of. Nothing <laughs> is off limits. As a matter of fact, when you think of a question for the team, use the comment section to ask the questions, and later on, we're gonna feature your questions live. Now, without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to Court to do another introduction and get things started. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Courtney, and hi to all of you that are joining. Uh, normally, I would be doing this in the picture that you see here behind me at MIT. That's the first building at MIT at its current location. I'd be there except for I have uh, woke up this morning to find out that my water heater is leaking. So I need to be at home with my phone on and we might hear from the plumber while we're doing this session. I hope that doesn't happen, but if we do, I'll go on mute and Alex and Molly will handle this. Uh, part of the reason I'm starting off here is that I have been the faculty director for the AMP for about 11 years. So I have a, the organizational memory of all the things that we've done with the program over the years, who's come, what has happened to them since they've left. And so that's what I'll do uh, starting off, just get you oriented because I've been doing it for a while. And then when we ask questions, we're going to even uh, have an even conversation uh, split between Alex, Molly and I because it takes a team of us to deliver this uh, really uh, intense uh, and fun uh, and transformative experience. Uh, so that's why there's a team of us that are talking to you today. Uh, so uh, what I wanna do, just give you a sense of the agenda is to, we'll start out by just giving you a quick orientation to MIT and the program itself. And then we'll pause after about five slides or so uh, to take your questions. Um, and so uh, we have some other slides that we can go to if we need to, but I want to get some of the basics down because uh, then we can have a much richer conversation about what goes on, how we do things, why, uh, what's involved in uh, being here, all those kinds uh, of things. So a little bit about MIT first. You'll understand why we design the program the way we do once you know a little bit about us. Uh, and then we'll come to your questions very shortly. All right, so quickly about MIT, what you can see here is uh, the MIT uh, and the Sloan uh, mission statements that are over there on the right. The one on the top is MIT's original mission statement, which was to advance knowledge and educate in science, technology, and other areas of scholarship. That's the part that we're in, other areas, management. Why is that? Because when MIT was founded at the just before the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, management wasn't thought of as a topic. But we've been doing management as a topic since the 1900s, early 1900s. And then the school was, uh, uh, was a department for a long time. And then it was founded as a school by a great donation from Alfred P. Sloan, who ran General Motors at the time, uh, 50s and 60s in that range. And we've been doing executive education for quite some time. But you can see that we're, we have this mission to serve the nation and the world and to do it with other people. So we're open to the, uh, to the wider world. MIT is it's one of the notable features of MIT. We're not closed off behind uh, gates, bars. We're not an ivory tower. We're engaged with the world. So that's the first thing to take away from our mission. And you'll see that we, the, how the AMP pays off that openness. Uh, down below, the part that has uh, the underlining in it, that's the Sloan mission, which is to develop principled, innovative leaders who improve the world. And that's where you come in. It's not just for MBA students that we exist. We also exist for current managers, people who are leading uh, companies today. And our goal is to help them be principled and innovative and to make change happen in the world that's positive. So that's, those are our missions. What you see over on the left is the original logo, which has on the left, I think you can make it out. On the left is a uh, blacksmith. He's got an, an, uh, an anvil there. And on the right is a scholar. That's again, there's a he there too. Uh, women uh, did not come to MIT back in the 1870s. They do now, we're about 50-50 in our MBA program. Uh, but that's the, uh, the, the logo and below it is our motto, mind and hand. 
um, this we began as an engineering school, and that's the mentality that we have in everything that we do, which is you don't really know anything until you've tried to apply it and fit it into context. So it's uh, other schools uh, that you probably know that are uh, in the US have models that are oriented around truth, light, things like that. And we think truth is relative. It's like a, a truth in one situation actually might not be the truth in another situation. So that's why it's always about applied. Can we have a concept, a framework, a principle and apply it and let's test it out in the real world. So that's our overriding mentality or mindset. Um, that, so that explains why we do the A and P the way we do. And I just want to talk with you a little bit about uh, what that is now, what's the purpose and how does it work? So the objective of the A&P program, this is our longest form program. It's five weeks back to back to back in June. Uh, and the goal is to provide an intimate, uh, transformative learning experience for mid-career executives. Um, and uh, they want to be here on campus. There's a lot of reasons they come that we can talk to you about. But uh, many of them already have an MBA. Uh, some don't, but they have MBA-like prior work experience. Um, the goal, uh, more specifically, is to help the people who come develop skills and acquire frameworks, as it says here, that are useful at the very senior parts of organizations and to make significant change happen in organizations. Uh, we also uh, purposely set out to connect this cohort of senior leaders to each other to prior cohorts of people who have come to the AMP and to the wider MIT Sloan community. So we really do believe in uh, developing principled innovative leaders and developing them together and creating um, a community of people that have this shared experience of being at MIT. And then part of our other goal is we wanna connect the people who come to the AMP to the wider ecosystem around MIT. If you don't know MIT that well, we're, really it's, it's a city university, a research-based uh, university in the city. And we can go out and see labs, talk to startups, large companies, talk to government executives. They're all right here. It's a very dense innovation ecosystem. And our uh, objective is to get you out and in it so that you can be uh, a part of it. It's a very distinct place. I don't want to say unique because there are other places that have a lot of the same qualities, but MIT is its own special, uh, soup that it swims in and uh, we want to make sure you you know how to do that um so uh, that's our purpose um let me say a little bit about the profile of people who come they have a lot of work experience usually 15 to 20 years so we're talking about people usually the youngest people are late 30s um they're, but they're most of them are in their mid 40s and 50s we have some people in their 60s too and they have experience working across businesses. So across geographies, functions, business lines, uh, uh, they can speak spoken, they can speak business English fluently. Um, and they've probably also had some international exposure. Usually they come because they or their companies have an urgent agenda that they want to uh, these people to help on, uh, the participants to help on. And we also look for people who are open to helping others, who have that orientation, who have that serving mindset, who want to be part of the community and contribute to it, not just take from it. Uh, and then the other thing that um, uh, people uh, are doing when they come here is they're working on themselves as leaders. What they realize that what got them to where they are today isn't necessarily what's going to take them to where they need to be tomorrow. So who are these people? A few facts, and then uh, we'll, we'll turn the slides off for a second so you can see our faces a little better. And uh, we'll take your questions, okay? And we have some others that we typically get asked just in case you can't think of a good question. Don't worry, we have a couple. All right, so who else, uh, who comes? And I'm, I don't know if you can see all of this. If you get right close to the laptop like I'm doing, you can probably see that uh, if we have um, about 30 to 40 people, a few will come from the United States, but it is by no means the dominant source geographically of the participants. Most people come from somewhere else in the world outside of North America. Many come from Europe, 
and South America. We also get plenty of people from Asia and Africa. Australia and New Zealand comes as well. So it's it's really international in terms of feel in the classroom over the course of the five weeks. The other thing you can see across the top, that first bar chart near the top, is that they come from all kinds of sectors. They're not just tech sectors. It's banking and finance. There's consumer goods. Uh, it's pharmaceuticals, the medical world. So pretty much every sector you might imagine, usually there's someone coming from that sector and all a wide uh, variety of functions, finance, operations, technology, marketing. So real diversity is what I hope you're hearing uh, is in the room. And we like it that and we design for that. So we like the diversity of geography, function, sector. And I'll say one more thing about this. So you might ask yourself, well, what do these people have in common? And the answer is they all have enterprise level issues and they care about those kinds of issues and they also wanna work on themselves. And there's a lot for these people to talk about with each other, just on those two things, how they can develop as enterprise leaders and how they can address enterprise level issues. All right. Courtney, let's stop there. That's enough talking by me. Let's stop there, see if we have some questions or maybe a question to the three of us, and then we'll we'll make this a conversation rather than a presentation. Definitely, although I did enjoy the slides and it looks like we haven't been interrupted by the plumber yet. So yes. um, I think I'm safe to ask this question for you, Court. In the past, why have people chose to come to AMP? Yeah, the um, we've actually never been to anybody else's AMP. Other schools do have them. So all we're relying on here is what people tell us when they were making choices between programs. The reason they chose us, it stands out almost with uh, with everyone, which is the small size of this AMP relative to other AMP programs. So we have maximum 42 people. That's most other AMPs have 70, 80, sometimes more than 100 people in them. You might remember I used the, the word intimate. We're trying to create a small group of people that can get to know each other well, work together intimately, informally. We think that's what really drives transformation and learning. So small cohort size, we think, creates a richer learning experience, a richer cohort experience. So that's one of the principles behind the design of the program. The other thing is they like our combination of content, technology, strategy, management, those things they don't see as uh, integrated uh, in as prominent uh, in other AMP programs as they do in the MIT uh, AMP program. And they also like the international flavor of it. I, there, have been, there are many other reasons that people come, maybe our Alex and Molly want to come in, but those are the ones that stand out to me. Yeah, I think the, the other reason people articulate a lot is one that Court covered fairly well on one of his first slides, which is our approach to teaching and learning. Um, we are at this level of senior leadership very far removed from the case method. We really, if, if we're going through um, content uh, with faculty, we don't want you synthesizing that theory through the lens of a case that may be published 10 years ago that's not relevant to your, your sector or your role. We want you kind of pushing that through the lens of, of real challenges you're facing right now or someone else at your table who's a little closer to the problem. Um, so I, I, I hear a lot in the conversations I have with, with applicants an, an interest in working on a real problem and not having this be theoretical only in nature, but really a practical application of, of the content that we're pulling into this program. Thanks, Molly, and thanks, Court. That's a really great answer. And that leads me to my next question, which is what differentiates this AMP from other AMP programs, which might be tough if you haven't taken the other ones, but you can give it a try. Well, another thing I heard, and Molly alluded to this, which is in many other AMP programs, they seek intimacy by having people prepare cases the night before in smaller groups. And as Molly said, we don't use the case method that heavily. We, you'll see a few, but mostly we want people to connect around their actual business problems they're facing today. So that's where the mind and hand comes in. Um, and when if we do anything at the end of the class day, it's usually to go see uh, a company or a lab or to do some team building or have dinner together. We're not having people stay up at night preparing cases. And for a lot of experienced executives, they, they say things to us like, I'm done with the case method now, Cord. I'm such a relief to be here and not have to do that 
nightly preparation that I did while I got my MBA. Alex, yes. anything you need to add? Or Molly, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I can jump in. I, I think, again, Cord has already mentioned this, but um, I also don't think you can really replicate the experience from an ecosystem perspective. Um, there's something really unique about MIT. If you've ever visited Cambridge and you're walking down the street, it's very hard to differentiate between what is a campus building and, and what is yes. an industrial partner that has located there to exchange with MIT. Um, we're also a, a really open and energizing campus. Um, when we talk about innovation on our campus, one of our past presidents said that, you know, uh, our approach to innovation used to be that you give people a lot of freedom, a little budget, then they bounce off each other, they cross pollinate. Um, you see that in our classroom, you see that outside of our classroom. We're very intentional in getting you plugged in and connected to that ecosystem. And there's just, um, there's something really special about it. Uh, we, we really want people to come to our program to seek outside ideas and to really be energized by what's going on in and around the classroom. I think that's something that would be very, very hard to, to replicate elsewhere. Definitely. I think that's why they call it the most innovative square mile in the world, Kendall Square. So I just wanted to go through. I couldn't do an hour long talk without mentioning that part because um, I think it's really important to touch on. So my next question is kind of more about the content. What are the main objectives of AMP? Oh, it looks like Court also has a thought on it too. Go ahead. Well, I'm, not I'm noticing there's a question of uh, how many rounds of this have we done so far and what is about remote learning? Some of the questions I notice are about other programs. We're not gonna talk about those today, like the design thinking, pricing programs, but uh, so I wanna focus on some of the questions that have come up so far. Uh, let me just say in terms of how many rounds of this. this yeah. Is for, um, uh, yeah, Fabrizio's question. Uh, this is the 12th time coming up that we will have done this in its current format. There were earlier versions of the AMP, but this one is the one that I've been around uh, for the, the faculty director for all this time. We do it once a year uh, and we improve it every year uh, and add to it every year. Um, so we we think we've gotten pretty good at it. Um, this year, um, we are adding online sessions. This is why I wanted to come to this, Courtney. Uh, we're adding online sessions before and after so that we can get across some enterprise level content uh, before we start and provide it after. And that frees up space during the five weeks uh, for people to work with each other on their problems. So uh, Jason, I think you have a question about the uh, interdependency of people in the course. We want people who will help each other, who have who have uh, similar, you know, lots of work experience, who might bring different lenses to the actual work that people have. So we set aside time every week, a significant chunk of a day for people where it's sort of open, uh, where we facilitate uh, people working on the actual business challenges that they have right now. So um, the online part that we do, and then I'll be quiet and others can comment uh, or ask a question. The online part that we do is on Zoom. It's not on live stream like we're doing here now, but it's on Zoom. We think we got pretty good at doing that over uh, the course of the uh, epidemic. Um, so we do breakouts, we do all kinds of interactivity there, but mostly the reason we do AMP the way we do is people really wanna come here and be together on the MIT campus for all the reasons that we've been in. We think you're also good at the online stuff. If you're thinking about this, just know that there will be online components, but that's not the main event. That's not the main way this course is delivered. How am I doing here for clarity? Great. Awesome. So yeah, while we wait for more questions to come in, I wanted to know what the main objectives are for AMP and then what a typical day looks like. So either Court, Alex, or Molly, whoever wants to jump on that one, go ahead. A typical day at AMP or the objectives you might walk away with? Um, I think a typical day at AMP um, com comprises of several different things. There's obviously a lot of classroom learning from our faculty across the Institute. Um, we make a point to visit different places in the MIT ecosystem, whether that's a lab at MIT or a company nearby. Um, we have a personal one-on-one -on -one coaching component. So you'll each be assigned a one-on-one -on -one coach that you'll meet with 
a few times throughout the program and once after the program. Uh, as Court mentioned, we also are carving out time uh, this year for more time for working on your own personal projects and working with your cohorts and uh, learning together and being able to contribute to each other's projects. There's also uh, more fun uh, components, like we usually do a cohort dinner every week. Uh, we do a nice little graduation ceremony at the end. So um, by the end of the program, you will be uh, very close with uh, your fellow cohort members through uh, formal learning and then the more informal uh, offerings that we have throughout the program. I just wanted to say, don't leave out the part about yoga, Alex. Uh, because we also believe that senior executives are under a lot of pressure and they need to develop practices around resilience. And so one of the ways we try to develop that is with yoga. So we do that once a week. Uh, and we do some other things that are designed to help sort of the whole executive. Not It's not just about cognitive skill and strategic frameworks. It's all about your, also about your psychological makeup, emotional resilience, those kinds of things. Yeah, and just to, to add- that. Sorry, to add one more thing, um, when you're looking at a day with us, I think as compared to some other programs, it is important to note that we really think it's important on top of the work you're doing with us to build in time for rest and reflection. Um, this is something that we want to be a transformative learning experience. It's just something you can't do um, if you're burnt out by week three because you've been with us until midnight in the classroom three nights a week. So um, we we schedule some pretty dense days, uh, but those days are eight to four, nine to five. Um, and as Alex mentioned, there may be social uh, networking events in the evening. You might have a day where, you know, the tail visit of a go and see takes you a bit outside of those, you know, 5 p.m. hours. But evenings and weekends are really for you. They can be to go beyond and, and, and inject yourself further into the ecosystem, but they can also really be uh, an opportunity to, to rest, um, to make deeper uh, relationships with your peers, to explore um, New England. Uh, we're not we're not scheduling you to the point where every waking minute is inside of a classroom. I love that. It sounds like we're preventing burnout within the program as well. So that's yeah. always great for well-being. I love that. So Courtney, I'm thinking, uh, go ahead, go ahead, Court. Go to some of the questions. Like I feel like I think I saw one yeah. about how the program changed the last three years. Yeah, so how has this program evolved over the last three years? I think this specifically is pointing to something that might have happened in 2020 that we're all aware of. <laughs> well, there were a couple of years there where we didn't deliver it. So let's just acknowledge that because it was just everything was shut down. But in the last three times that we've delivered, there's been a number of changes. I, I think it's more evolution than transformation. So you might imagine that we have added certain kinds of content um, over the last three years. For example, around uh, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, those are all coming to the fore. And we do that every year in terms of things that are happening outside that have fairly immediate implications for businesses and executives uh, today. So part of the content has changed. We've always had plenty of innovation and uh, digitalization content. Um, by the way, someone asked, uh, if I'm a non-engineer and a non-IT person, am I going to be okay? Am I going to be intimidated? That's you, um, non-Kubella. I hope I'm saying your name properly. Uh, you'll be fine. We have plenty of non-IT people in the program. Uh, it, it, there are people who, again, there are many people from marketing, HR, who don't think of themselves as IT. There are people who come from very non-traditional people who don't think of uh, packaged goods or uh, online gaming as being all that technical. And yet we've had the marketing director for uh, Finland's biggest uh, gaming company come here. She didn't think of herself as an IT person. So um, we've added lots of content to come back to what's changed. We've added more time for people to work on their projects. Uh, we've, we're adding this year more online uh, pre and post, uh, but we've always had innovation content and I just need to say it, a lot more people and leadership content than many people are expecting. They're expecting the digital and the IT stuff. Yeah, we do that. Good stuff. But there's much more about the people dimension of enterprise leadership than many people expect. They don't realize that MIT has a long history in this region. Uh, Ed Schein wrote the book about organizational culture. Peter Senge wrote an uh, excellent book about enterprise leadership and the learning organization. Um, the, 
the inventor, uh, Douglas McGregor, the inventor of Theory X, Theory Y, was a faculty member here. So we do quite a bit of that. That's so great. And I love that last question, particularly because I think it's important not to rule yourself out if you're not in the engineering and IT space, sure. because it's MIT um, and it's so welcoming as well. So I loved that question in particular. And as we wait for more questions to come in, you know that I have a plethora of questions that I'm dying to ask you. So I'm wondering like what people do with their AMP certificate and AMP experience. So shifting to post AMP, how do they get the most out of that? Anybody shall can I, take this question. Okay, shall I take that just a stab at that? The answer is because they're so different, they all do different things. That's the simple answer. Um, what most people do is take uh, their project back uh, or take something they've been working on while they've been here that integrates all the learning that we do over five weeks and all the connections they've made uh, with each other and the MIT world. Uh, they take something back and they implement it. So we hear about people doing things like taking leather out of the shoe supply chain or repositioning their uh, warehouses, uh, you know, some very practical applied things. We also have people who go back and begin to work on transforming uh, the product offering of their company, the culture of their company. Some people are coming because they were about to be promoted and they, they get promoted um, or they change jobs. Some people decide, you know what, I really want to be an entrepreneur and now is the time. And they've been given courage seeing other entrepreneurs here at MIT. So the outcomes are quite varied uh, depending upon what people's objectives are. Molly and Alex, what did I leave out? Um, well, I just actually wanted to give a plug to on our website. There's some really great testimonials for oh. recent uh, AMP alum. Uh, so you can kind of get a sense of all the different ways that people uh, leave AMP and what they've been doing post AMP, what maybe brought them to AMP and how they've used their five weeks uh, after long after the five weeks. And so there's some really good blog posts uh, that go into detail there. And then I'll just add one more thing, which is that we um, rarely see people who don't say, stay connected to us as a program one way or another. Um, as you may know, we offer an AMP reunion every year, um, which is free of cost to, to past participants to come to engage with us for, for two full days on campus, uh, to, to see some new content, to meet the current cohort. Um, but we also are aware um, that from a cohort perspective, people are in touch constantly. We have, we have, I say this in a lot of uh, my conversations with prospective participants, we have a WhatsApp thread, I have to mute it, uh, because it's just so active. Um, people, when we look around a, a room of participants, there's hundreds of years of experience in the room. Um, and so that's not just something that's enriching the program while you're on campus. I think we find if you're facing a challenge, um, it's very unlikely that, that one of your peers is not in a similar position. So um, I think we see a lot of the value in the program beyond the five weeks also coming from the cohort and the deep connections that are built with, with, with us here on campus. That's great to hear. And kind of leads me to my next question of what brings people to AMP? So why, why would they come with a problem? I think Court kind of alluded to this earlier, but what really is it that drives people to come to AMP? Um, let me step in on this. One of, a couple of things is they, they think I've reached this point in my career. Um, I think if I want to do something different, um, I need to refresh my brain. I need to refresh myself. I want to work on myself as an enterprise leader and maybe change direction a little bit. So I gave the example of someone who was in a, working for a big company. They decided they wanted to be an entrepreneur. Other people, um, they said, look, I'm in line for this promotion. I need to be ready. Uh, and I don't feel yet like I am fresh on. I've been in my silo. I've been in my region of the world. I need to get a broader view and they come to MIT. Uh, we've had many entrepreneurs join the program. I mean, it's about uh, there's a significant percentage of people who are, you know, the top one, two, or three people in, in an entrepreneurial company, and they say, "I'm coming to MIT to sort of wash my brain. I've been so deep into my startup, uh, and it's it's up, it's scaling. It, you know, that's it. They can do without me for five weeks, but I gotta think about what the next stage is. And so that's when they reach out to us." Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I saw on the website uh, when I revisited it this morning and was reading it, 
Uh, a mention of diversity and international participants. Uh, what did they have in common? What do these elements have in common with uh, AMP? Well, I, again, I think it's, it, uh, Courtney, it comes back to they want to work on themselves. They realize that what got them to where they are is not necessarily going to be what is going to help them in the future. So the, the desire to work on themselves as leaders, reflect on how they need to show up differently in the future. That's common to everybody who comes. Uh, but also they have this desire to sort of uh, get practice. Uh, if you're working out, you need reps, repetitions. They want reps on enterprise level issues and lots of different ways of looking at that. And that's, we designed the program to do that. We pick the cohort to be able to do that. That's great. Um, so it, that kind of answers um, one of the questions in the chat, which is if international uh, folks are eligible to join the program, of course, we have such a um, globally diverse cohort every year. We're really excited that people join us from all over. So that answers that question as well. And just kind of circling backwards here, let's start from the beginning and just think about the application process. What is the application process like? Where would I apply and how long does it take? So if either of you, if any of you want to jump on that, I'm just so curious of where it starts. What's the beginning? Yeah, I'm happy to jump on that. Um, awesome. Intentionally, our application is very light. Um, it's, it's not a testing mechanism. It's really to give us the information that we need uh, to help you figure out if this is the right program for you at this point in your career. Um, so uh, it should not take you more than 30 minutes to, to fill out the application. Um, it's, it's really a few questions about your background, your motivations, um, challenges that you're facing at the moment, um, as well as either a, a, an updated CV or um, a link to your LinkedIn profile. And that's about it. Um, and, and once you have submitted your uh, materials and you formally expressed interest in the program, you'll hear from someone on our team um, in five to 10 business days, usually faster. Um, at which point we, um, what we tend to do is uh, schedule conversations with everyone who looks like they might be a good fit on paper, um, just to make sure it's a, a, what we're offering is, is going to be helpful to you at this point. Um, we recognize this is a really big investment for our participants. So it's, it's not simply a matter of us screening to see if you'll be a good fit for our program on our end. It's also to make sure that what you're looking for is what we're offering. Um, so it's a really personal uh, process once you've submitted the formal paperwork. Um, and if you are interested, you're not sure if you're a good fit, we'd still encourage you to go ahead, complete that application. Um, it's fairly light. It just really gives us the information that'll, that'll help guide you whether this program or another program in our portfolio is a right fit for you at this time. Uh, do we, uh, Alex and Molly, I, th I think we can answer Rajiv's question about the visa uh, support. Uh, is, okay, go, yep. go ahead. Once you are, um, once you have expressed interest in our program and put down a deposit, we are able to provide the documentation um, you would need to obtain the correct visa to attend our program. And do we help on job placement? Uh, I'm not quite sure I got um, the essence of your question, Kasimi. I can read that several different ways. We don't provide uh, career services the way a university might. So um, you, uh, you're, uh, if you're asking, you know, do we have a way of a, uh, to help you connect you with employers or possible job openings? That's not really what we do. Um, we don't really have any statistics that we can track that would be meaningful about employment after attending here. Why? Just because of the diversity of the group, the, the, the kinds of jobs they have are so different. And not everyone here is uh, coming here in order to get a job or to get a promotion. Other people have other objectives. I did want to just circle back. I can see Julie wrote in the chat when our next application deadline is, which is April 14th. Uh, but we are currently at a nearly full cohort. So I would encourage you if you're interested to apply or reach out before then uh, if you have any questions about about if this program is the right fit for you. How, could we go back to the slides for a second, Cordy? Would that be good? We can show just the campus and people can actually see what we were talking about, how in, uh, dense the uh, ecosystem here here is. Maybe that'll spark a question or maybe we can show the takeaways which is partly the tenor of these recent questions. Let's see. Of course, because those are kind of the questions that I would be asking. So I think a visual okay. would make a lot of sense. Sure. So this is kind on. of, uh, Let me go to, yeah, there we are. 
So can you see that uh, red oval there? Yeah, that's incredible. Just seeing all the businesses. It's so it's a bit overwhelming. <laughs> so our classroom and the um, uh, is right in right underneath the word exec there. Okay, so that's where we are. The place where everyone stays is right above the little the red oval, basically above the T in MIT. That's where everyone stays, uh, and that stay, there's the accommodations are part of the uh, tuition. Uh, but you can see that the red part is MIT, but all around us are all these uh, companies, large, small, some tech, some pharma, uh, all kinds uh, of companies. I mean, Disney Research is here, so most people don't think of them as being a tech-oriented uh, organization, but they are. Uh, so. These are the kinds of companies that we go and see. These are the kinds of executives. Why are they here? They're here partly to recruit talent, but also to be near each other so that they're part of the ideas that are circulating all the time around MIT. So it's a really rich, dense, exciting environment. You go to a coffee shop in this picture, and there's lots of them. The conversations you can hear are quite amazing. Uh, venture capital is in the room. So uh, government is here, and people are having really uh, robust, rich, very broad-ranging conversations all the time, all, uh, all year long, all around us. What else might be useful? How about the takeaways? So I'll just leave this up here and we'll see if this sparks other ideas. Uh, this gives you a little bit, Courtney, you were asking before about what do people have at the end or what do they hope to gain? And um, so this is some of what people mentioned to us. Some of it is skill sets. Some of it is uh, connection. Uh, there's a wide variety of things on this, uh, this page. So I'll just leave this up here and then let's see if we have other questions. I did think of a question. So when I come to AMP, I'm there for a long time in Cambridge. Um, do I bring my family with me? What does that look like? Um, I mean, you certainly can. We do encourage people to kind of immerse themselves in the experience uh, while they're here. Uh, and like Molly said earlier, we're not scheduling you, you know, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. So there is time to, you know, rest and relax at the end of the day. And uh, whether that's mingling with your cohort and networking with your cohort, or if you do need to bring your family. But we do try to encourage people to come immerse themselves fully. A lot of people will bring their family at the end of the program. The family is invited to the graduation ceremony. So that can kind of be a good balance to be able to fully commit yourself to the program, uh, to your cohort, but still be able to uh, invite your family to kind of experience what you've been experiencing for the five weeks. Yeah. And then just to add on top of that, um, it's, it's not often the case, but we have gotten feedback um, occasionally that uh, that is the bar for some folks participating, which is, is certainly not what we want for you. Um, so while we don't provide childcare, we don't provide summer camps. Um, if this is what's going to prevent you from being with us on campus, we do have resources we can point you to. Um, so if, if you need to have a conversation about, for us about wraparound care, um, accommodations for your family, uh, child care while you're here with us on campus, please reach directly out to that, to that um, exec ed at AMP email address or exec ed AMP at MIT.edu. And, and we're happy to kind of give you a sense of what resources are available and how we can make it possible for you to be with us on campus. That's great. And while I'm preparing for AMP and I'm in this headspace of planning ahead, what makes for a successful AMP experience? How can I prepare myself before the program starts? Um, sure. Uh, Alex, Alex alluded to this in her last answer. Um, we would like you to do the best that you can to be fully physically and mentally present with us in the classroom. Um, that takes a lot of work up front to set up, um, particularly if, if you're you know, leading a complex team, but we really we'd like you to lean on your teams back at your company so that you can be fully present with us in the classroom. Um, in terms of formal pre-work, we think it's pretty light. Um, if we're sending you pre-reads, they're in, you know, the four to six page range, not the 40 to 60 page range. Uh, we'd like you to have those completed by the time you join us on campus. We also have a couple of leadership assessments that we send out uh, with really good advance notice so that you can coordinate that um, within your company. 
Um, but, but the best thing you can do for yourself is to set yourself up to be able to unplug from one or more of your roles outside of the program um, so that you can be fully present with us in the classroom. That's awesome. Has a question about the fully commit versus family. Are there weekend responsibilities? Maybe I could just come in on that. Uh, so Jason, just for you, you should know that we meet on uh, the very first Saturday to do some team building. It's really important to us that we bond the cohort together. So the only weekend day is that that we take up. You're on your own otherwise. Um, is uh, and people do all kinds of things like which I can talk about if you're interested. But the uh, the first Saturday we do team building, and we use one of the assessments that uh, Molly just mentioned uh, in order to bond the group together, help them work together. We can't have the group fracture or develop little clicks. Uh, we're trying to produce one big bonded uh, group, big meaning about 30 people who really is comfortable just working with anybody in the group um, and can get value from anyone in the group. So that's why the Saturday, that first Saturday is important from our perspective for the learning and the overall experience. But otherwise, on your own, family can come, you can go see family, perfectly fine. Yeah, and I just want to chime I think as our cohort is very diverse, how they handle the family versus fully committed piece is also diverse. I'm thinking of an alum from last year who every weekend flew home to Seattle to see his family. Some people might bring their families. Some people might uh, visit halfway through and then have their family comes at the end. So um, there are a lot of different ways uh, to to figure that out and it's kind of what works for your personal uh, support network but that's certainly a big factor to consider before you arrive on campus at MIT. That's great and just thinking about preparing and maybe the interview stage before I come to AMP and before I come to MIT. Um, Molly, I think you mentioned there's a Zoom interview. Who is that done with and what should I expect and how should I prepare for that? Um, so it can be with any member of our director team. Um, most often it's with me, but uh, every now and again, I, I take time off, um, in which case you might speak to Court or Alex. Um, in terms of preparing, it's, it's not a hugely formal interview. It's a conversation. Um, and it really is a conversation to mutually assess if the program is a good fit. So what's helpful to just give thought to before you come, um, what are you looking to get out of a program? Uh, why are you pursuing a program at this time? what strategic challenges are you facing? You know, what really meaty challenge might you like to bring to the classroom to get some help from our faculty uh, or your peers? That's great. And I, I feel like we've been chatting for a little bit here, so I'm not intimidated to talk to you at all. I think that would be a great experience for someone considering AMP. So that's really awesome. So that leads me to one of my next questions, which is about what the application process looks like. And then after you get accepted, like, and, and after you've prepared, you come to AMP, you come to MIT, how do I get the most out of the AMP experience while I'm here? I'm happy to jump on that as well. Um, as I've mentioned that the application process is fairly light. Once you've formally completed the application process, you'll hear from our registration team relatively quickly. We say five to 10 business days, it's often much quicker than that. Um, if we feel like you look like a good fit for the program on paper, we will schedule a time to meet with someone on our director team, um, usually Alex or myself. Uh, occasionally, um, we'll schedule a second phone call uh, with one of our faculty directors, um, particularly if you have specific content questions um, that may be a better fit for, for kind of their uh, expertise. Um, and then once our uh, conversation has happened, you'll hear a decision from our, our registration team within a couple of business days. Um, awesome. In terms of then preparing, uh, that looks different <laughs> depending on what point in the cycle you're joining us. Um, Alex, do you want to speak a bit to our schedule for, for sending out pre-work and how we organize that for our participants? Sure. So we do like to engage with you know, our admitted participants early on in the process where, you know, you're going to be hearing from us 
uh, a lot before your arrival in Cambridge in May. Um, so we do have a cadence of pre-work that we usually start sending out uh, early to mid-March. Um, some of these are readings to kind of get everyone in the same headspace, uh, to have everyone on the same like level playing field on certain topics. I know some people, you know, might have a lot of financial experience. Some people might not have any. So we do try to uh, level the playing field a bit uh, with our pre-work. Uh, we also, as Court and Molly have talked about, we are going to do some pre-sessions before uh, arrival to campus. So those will be on Zoom uh, and you'll get a chance to really interact with your cohort and meet the people that you're going to be spending five weeks with in Cambridge. You'll get to meet some of our great faculty uh, and like you said, just really get you in the headspace. And a lot of people who are coming haven't, you know, done any sort of formal education in, in a few decades. So uh, it kind of orients you a little bit to the idea of, of homework and, and sitting in a classroom and learning. So um, we do try to do a good job of keeping in touch. Um, we're always, you know, people have a lot of questions as they're preparing for five weeks away from their jobs, from their families. So we welcome any questions. We've probably gotten it before. So um, we are a very welcoming team. We have a great team of program managers that will be helping us on site as well. Um, so a lot of people will be here to, to assist you and to get you prepared uh, for your arrival. Thanks, Alex and Molly. Those are great ways to um, answer that question. And I'm sure more questions will come out of it. But for now, Court, can you tell me more about the qualifications and that side of things? Yeah, I just I noticed the question uh, came through earlier, Courtney. So I just wanted to maybe I'll go back to those slides, um, what we're what we're looking for. And just talk quickly about the qualifications. So 15 to 20 years of work experience, that's the main qualification. We need, we're looking for people that have dealt with complexities in business, who have managed uh, tensions before. Someone asked, "Could it, is this program appropriate for a junior product manager, a project manager, or a junior product manager?" They're not appropriate. They they're not going to be able to contribute to a conversation uh, that a startup executive wants to have, or someone who's been managing quality across a large organization, or someone who's been running a country. Uh, for a large, they're just not going to be able to have a good, they're not going to be able to help those other people. So for us, the experience is really what matters. If you have an MBA, terrific. Uh, generally, people do. But uh, the main thing is experience and experience working cross-functionally, cross-geographically, um, uh, on complex issues, some familiarity with tensions and polarities in business. That's what matters to us. Have you? Can you demonstrate that you have had that before? Um, other things that we look for, we tend to have a little bit of a bias, but we don't exclude everybody, but we'd have a little bit of a bias toward people with operating experience who are running a company or part of a company, who are in the operations of the company. Uh, typically, someone who's been an investor and an investor only, uh, who has not been deep in the operational challenges of a business, they also contribute less to the conversation. They, they've, they've been a little bit above it or outside of it. And so, uh, but very often many investors have also been operators. Um, and so that's ideal too. If, we, if, you're, if you've been both, that's terrific. We need you in the room. Other people need you in the room and we'll help you uh, be even better at doing both. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to, some of these nuances about what we look for. There are a lot of people who also apply. I talked to someone last week who had an MBA, but they didn't have enough experience. They hadn't dealt with complexity. They hadn't had an operating role. They hadn't had a lot of people reporting to them. They really hadn't had to hire and fire. So that's just give you a little bit more texture around uh, what were uh, what the qualifications are. And many, much of this we can see on paper, but you may not have had a chance to go to our website and see some of the more of the details here. Hope that's helpful. Yeah, that's great. I think that's really um, informative about the kind of the qualifications that you would have to um, fall into. Yeah. All right, so as we're waiting for a few more questions to come in here, I actually wanted to turn it over to three of you and go around and say a moment that you had an aha moment when you were leading the AMP uh, event, like program. So maybe a favorite moment, maybe a funny moment. So 
We have about 10 minutes left, so we'll wrap things up um, quickly. So make sure you get your last questions in while we go around and share a favorite moment of AMP. So maybe Court, if you want to start with your favorite AMP moment. Um, that's such a great question. There's been so many it's moments. <laughs> really, really, I, I feel that way. This is the, uh, I love delivering this experience. It's, I've been doing it now for 11 years. It's one of the most fun things I do all year long. And why? Because people can, by the end, people can say, this is how my thinking has evolved. This is how my confidence has evolved. And there's just nothing better than hearing that. It's like, uh, you know, Court, I'm so glad I came here and I'm surprised at the people that I was exposed to. I didn't know MIT had someone working on X and you helped me meet them. And so that's been, for me, that's the great pleasure of being a part of this, this team and this experience. Yeah, I would say similarly, I mean, there's so many great moments, but I think just in general, the five weeks we spend together as as a team and as a cohort is such a unique chance to really get to know each other, whether it's chatting over pizza at dinner or whether it's, you know, watching uh, the cohort compete in a simulation. Um, you know, I, as Molly talked about the WhatsApp groups, I'm still in the WhatsApp groups and still talking to, uh, to to people who have come, you know, years and years ago. Um, that also kind of leads you to the reunion piece of it and being able to connect with people that uh, attended AMPS in the past and um, being able to see, you know, how they've uh, used their AMP experience um, is a really great opportunity to to just stay connected to people that you really bond with over over the five weeks. Yeah, and I can just say during the program, uh, uh, every single time, my, my favorite aspect is the energy in the classroom. Um, you would be surprised how energetic people are on week four of a very dense program. And it's really, I don't think that in our adult lives, we get many opportunities to step away from what it is uh, we have our heads down on day to day, um, to focus on ourselves and to just uh, look beyond our current role. So um, I think we get to share in the excitement people have in this refresh. Um, and then I'll say very recently, I was lucky enough to work on a, a totally distinct program with Court um, that was a, a past uh, program participant bringing back senior members of his company um, to do a little more of a deep dive on the MIT campus. And, and the very first day of the program, he uh, presented on, on what the program did for him, how it changed his outlook. Um, and, you know, you get people who are extremely good at what they do and understanding that there, there really is the opportunity to change their way of thinking is, I think, quite powerful. Yeah, that's incredible. Thank you all for sharing these moments. And it looks like we've had a great hour of questions. And if you want to create moments like this yourself and you want to learn more, please feel free to email execedamp at mit.edu. I'll put that on the screen right now if you want to take note of that. And also learn more by visiting our website, executive.mit.edu slash amp. So I just wanted to say thank you everyone for joining and we hope to see you soon at the program. And any closing remarks if I missed anything from anyone and thank you to our three lovely speakers. So we hope to see you soon. <laughs> You're very kind <laughs> with that remark, Courtney, thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you everybody for joining, bye-bye.